Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining me uh, for another episode of Condo Insider. Uh, my name is Jane Sugimura, and I'm going to be your host for this uh, episode. And this is a continuing uh, part of the series that you know I've uh, uh, I've used uh, this platform for, and this is to introduce you to your uh, candidates running for elected office, mainly because I get emails, I get phone calls. And for people who want to grumble, and you know what I tell them? I said, you got to call your elected official. And they tell me, well, I don't know who that is. So, you know, I'm on a, I'm a, I'm standing on my soapbox. And I'm saying condo owners, I know they vote. I know they vote. And, but, you know, you need to do a better job in uh, learning your, uh, you know, meeting your candidates, finding out what, what, what they stand for, whether they're going to support your issues. And so I hope, you know, uh, the series, you know, uh, will help you. And I want to introduce you to my guest today. His name is Matt Weyer, and he is running for the city council in the uh, uh, November general election. Hi, Matt. Aloha. Thank you for having me. And, you know, Matt, is uh, this is his first, uh, I think it's your first elected, uh, first uh, campaign, right? Yes, first time running. Right, and and he, he's he's a very young, knowledgeable man with you know lots of uh, practical experience, and so you know uh, I I would like him to tell us what is your background. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, and again, like I said, thank you for um, having me here today. Thank you for everybody tuning in. Uh, for me, after graduating from Midpac for high school, I went to UH Manoa. I uh, did my uh, grad degree in public administration, and then went over to the law school. Uh, you know, practiced right after law school as a domestic violence prosecutor, uh, and then decided to go into private practice. So I was uh, doing civil litigation over at uh, Goodsill, uh, and then came back to the city just because of my love for public policy and making the city work better for, for our community. So I was a policy advisor uh, for one of the council members, council member Tommy Waters. Uh, and then during the pandemic, uh, you know, just saw an opportunity to move over to the Department of Community Services, which is where I work now, uh, to help meet the needs of our community. Uh, and specifically right now, I work on affordable housing or housing opportunities and homeless service contracts. And of course, been on the neighborhood board, Waipawa Neighborhood Board for, for three terms and really appreciate the community, uh, you know, there and being a part of that process as well. And and Matt, you're running for the, the uh, seat in Council District Two, can you tell our listeners who, what is, what part of the island does, does that cover? Definitely. So District Two, by far the largest, I'll say one of the most beautiful, uh, runs from Kahalu all the way up uh, across North Shore down to Wahiwa Whitmore Village, and then down into Waikele and Kunia. Uh, so pretty large district, uh, homeowner association, condo associations across the district in different areas. Uh, and and like I said, it, it's you know a little over what sixty percent of the island maybe. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, it's a large district that you're running in, and this is your first time as as uh, running for an elected office, right? Yeah, first time running. It's been a lot of walking door to door. Um, I can say that's been the best part of this process. Uh, you know, just introducing myself to our community, uh, asking what our neighbors uh, want to see happening in the community. I think you hit the nail on the head earlier by saying that everybody really needs to be getting involved, you know, especially if you're living in an association, knowing who's going to represent you, being able to reach out when you have those questions, have those concerns, have those issues, I think it's super important. And that's a part of, you know, making my access, myself accessible to the community, right? Right. And, you know, so tell, tell us why you're running for office. Yeah, for me, I see uh, so many issues confronting our community, right? Uh, we see cost of living, cost of housing, uh, driving, you know, families away, affecting our younger folks coming out of college, having to move back in with their homes, seeing Kupuna not being able to watch their grandkids grow up. Um, I see infrastructure issues across the district. Um, again, being a very large district uh, from Kahalu up to Kahuku across to Wailua, uh, we see flooding, we see issues with our roads, our bridges, our streams. Uh, and really, I just see opportunities for the city to better meet the needs of our community, right? Um, you know, I want to use my experience, whether it's you know addressing traffic problems, addressing public safety and crime, helping fill those vacancies at HPD, um, or addressing the Department of Permitting and Planning and 
and filling those vacancies, making sure our permitting process is speeding up, making sure our enforcement is on point. Uh, I think that, you know, I want to use my experience in all three branches of city government uh, to help our community navigate that, right? I'm not going to always have all the answers. Um, you know, I have my skill sets, my background, my knowledge. And then I, I really believe by tapping into just the knowledge that exists in our community, um, you know, the knowledge that our residents had, because they're going to know what is best for their street, their neighborhood, their community, their building, uh, and just to help them navigate that, right, and achieve what, what they want to see. Uh, that's really wonderful to hear. What are your priorities, uh, you know, in, in, in this campaign? I mean, if you, if you win, if you win the yeah. election, what are your priorities? Yeah. Um, so one of the biggest issues I think is, is, you know, responding to our cost of living housing crisis. And I think working to solve that, we see fixes are going to affect the entire community, right? Because I think the department of permanent planning is a big part of that and looking at uh, why there are so many permitting issues, why there are enforcement issues? How do we speed up permitting? Uh, and I think that part of that is looking at how do we fill vacancies at the department? Because um, we've lost so many uh, planners to the private sector. Uh, and so I think we can fix that by working with human resources, uh, looking at pay differentials so we can kind of up the pay, right? Um, because just throwing money at the budget into the budget isn't going to fix it if you still have vacant positions, right? So we want to make sure we're filling those positions um, so the permitting process is moving along, better digitize that process, uh, you know, with online applications, uh, you know, look at, um, you know, a time frame maybe for when permits are approved. I know they introduced or did an automatic approval, um, you know, legislation, but I think one of the issues is there's not a consistent policy for when a permit is actually, you know, started. I think looking at self-certification, um, where architects can sign off on certain low-level permits, can help speed up that. I think our housing um, in general, right? We need to be supporting uh, density in the urban core. Uh, we need to be looking at how we fill those HPD vacancies, like I said, so we can have or be supporting public safety. And of course, infrastructure, like I said, um, you know, emergency preparedness, ensuring that our communities across the district have access to life-saving services, first responders, you know, we reduce flooding. There's just so much, right? And a lot of this is just coming from from the community, right? Walking door to door, talking story with them, hearing what they want to see. Uh, and so it's been really um, fruitful and edifying for me, right, to have those conversations. Well, you mentioned DPP, and that's a, one of the big, you know, departments in the city, and, and it's getting a whole lot of probably negative publicity in newspapers because of the uh, criminal indictments that came down. I mean, you I know, know that that's affecting the efficiency of the department because they're trying to fix things. We understand that, but you know, uh, you mentioned in your in in your in, in your district too. You have a lot of HOAs, you know, homeowner associations. You have condominiums, and they guess what? They had they need to you know get um, permits, you know, for their for their jobs. And what I'm hearing, I'm I have two different types of complaints. Mm -hmm. but what, what number one? It's hard to get contractors to make proposals uh, to, you know, these HOAs or condominium associations because they can't predict how long it's going to be take to get a permit. Mm -hmm. And in the time that they sign, you know, they make a proposal and, and let's say, you know, part of the process is getting permits, by the time they get their permits, maybe the cost of steel will go up and we're experiencing what is called the supply chain problems. Right, because we live in Hawaii. Exactly. Because yeah. of the pan pandemic, all we have all these shortages, and you know, from month to month, we really don't know, uh, you know, um, what the costs are going to be. We, we, I, I'm hearing from associations they can't even get a contractor to give them a bid, because mm -hmm. you know it takes so long for the process to go through, especially you know getting a permit that they can't give you a number. And and if you don't, if you can't get a proposal with a number, I mean, they can't say, oh, well, we think it's going to be 50,000, but maybe six months from now, if we don't have a permit, it's going to be 75,000. You know, they can't do exactly. proposals like that. And so that's, you know, causing such a hardship because, you know, you're talking about multifamily homes, some, some townhouses and you know, condominiums. And and in the, in the city, we've got this fire safety ordinance that at you know, and that was because of the Marco Polo fire in 2017. Mm -hmm. And this is, 
this is a major piece of board and uh, legislation. And although there are other municipalities in the United States that have met that are mandating fire sprinklers, mm -hmm. only Oahu, only Honolulu appears to be implementing it. Mm -hmm. You know, and 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 it's causing such a heartache to associations ten stories or above. And you have them in your district. Yeah, I think that that I mean that's a perfect example of the issues that arise when we do these you know unfunded mandates, right? I think you as, as a city you always want to be pursuing options that make it more economical, more feasible um, for for associations to come forward and fund projects, right? Versus just putting a mandate on them and not leaving them with an opportunity or an option to actually fund it, especially when you have such a diverse group of associations, right? Like right. Each, each association has its own issues, has its own funding issues, and we want to make sure that they have the support, right, to ensure that we're not putting that extra burden on our families that are already struggling under our rising costs, right? Or as the praise values go up, folks are having to pay more in their property tax, you know, and I think all of our families are facing all these other costs, right? And you want to make sure that we're, you know, approaching it, understanding, like, for example, I know that associations have to pay for their own rubbish pickup, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you look at that, if we're talking about a solving our affordable housing crisis, all right, a part of that includes having more density. And, and that's often what HOAs are providing, right? Especially condo associations. Mm -hmm. And so if we're wanting to incentivize uh, density, incentivize housing opportunities, we also want to make it more economically feasible and not add on extra costs, right? When uh, those residents are already paying property taxes and, you know, putting forward the same amount of money that other residents are that maybe are in a single family home. Right. And, you know, assuming, you know, if, if you get elected to, to the council district number two, I mean, we have been working, uh, not working, but we've been, you know, we've had a champion on the city council. Her name is council member Carol Fukunaga. Mm. And she's been our champion, but she's term limited. Mm. And so she's going. And so I hope you can become one of our champions. I mean, to stand up for condos. I mean, she has been the one that has gone and introduced uh, bills to extend deadlines because this fire safety ordinance, it's like the first in the nation. And it's the only one that's enforcing, you know, man, man in the installation of fire sprinklers in all buildings over 10 stories. Uh, and um, we've had to go back to the city and say, we need an extension. First of all, there's a pandemic happened, right? Mm -hmm. In 2020, after, you know, so naturally all the, the deadlines, you know, nobody could get inspections or anything else. So all the deadlines had to be extended one year because they didn't know how long the pandemic was going to last. Yeah. And then when it went into 2021, it got extended again. Yeah. And, you know, now because of, and, you know, last month in August, no, this month in August, I, I got a copy of the three month report that is issued by the uh, fire department. Mm -hmm. And there's over, uh, you know, and there's about 360 buildings in Honolulu that are subject to the ordinance and uh, about 320 of them, you know, uh, have to be, you know, you know, are, you know, don't are under are over 10 stories and do not have open exterior quarters. Yeah. Right. And so they have to either pass an LSE, which is a life safety evaluation uh, or install fire sprinklers. Mm -hmm. According to that report that came out, there's over 300 buildings in Honolulu that didn't pass their life safety evaluation. Wow. And yeah. all, of, all of them now have to either put in fire sprinklers or make other changes like a fire alarm system. They all require building permits. Mm -hmm. And so this further burdens the DPP. How are they going to mm -hmm. service us? How are they going to service us? We're exactly. going to have to go back to the city and ask for further extension because we only have three years, three years to 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 comply with the LSE, and there's no way the city's going to be able to process building permits for 300 high-rise buildings in three years. Yeah, and I think that what you're speaking to is is why all of our policy right needs to be decided, all of our legislation needs to be passed with input from those that it affects. And it has to reflect the actuality of, of what's going on on the ground, right? So if we have these arbitrary deadlines that we know we're not going to be meeting, or we have unfunded mandates, we have to assess how do we get to where we want to be, right? And that means coming to the associations, 
looking at the co the issues that you're bringing up, right? And talking through, okay, how do we how do we meet the needs of our residents to ensure that we can keep folks well, one keep associations afloat, right? Because we won't don't want them overly burdened, um, where you know there's issues with their income or or their you know being able to just finance everything that they need to, especially when we see you know maintenance costs and other things going up. But we want to also make sure that the actual residents, right, aren't aren't seeing dramatic increases in their and in, in their fees or their maintenance fees or their association fees to have to respond to that, right? And so I think that that's part of this whole process, right? And part of what I want to bring to the table as a council member is a willingness to advocate, right, for for our communities, for our residents, for my our constituents in the district, and ensure that there's that access to the process and that folks' needs are actually represented, right? Because I think it's easy um, to kind of fall into that um, space of just being comfortable and just, you know, moving along with the status quo or whatever seems like most likely to pass and not always having that conversation about, well, this is what folks actually need, right? This is what we actually need to do. Right. And let me just bring up while we're on the DPP. Yeah. I, I think I could go all day on the DPP. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe that's got to get broken down into a small, into smaller departments. But you know, townhomes, yeah. you have a lot of townhomes in your district, right? Yeah. What I have heard, and I only heard it recently in the last maybe 60, 90 days, that townhomes that are applying for permits mm -hmm. uh, through the DPP are being told that their buildings are not residential buildings which they are i mean yeah. they're no they're being deemed commercial and the dpp is is it, and and we can i i'm still looking for the source of where they're getting this and i i have had council member carol fukunaga and my council member uh brandon elefante's office trying to find where are they getting this you know this this information but there's yeah. to, to the uh to the uh, associations you guys are commercial and so therefore we're going to charge you thousands of dollars instead of a thousand dollars. So now uh, if you want to put PV on your roof, which you can under the state statute, mm -hmm. as long as you have insurance for the association, because the roof is a common element. But yeah. anyway, DPP is not now refusing to issue permits for PV on townhouse roofs. Yeah. And, I, and they're saying that um, um, uh, with townhouses, you are commercial, and so we're not. You you don't get the residential rate for permits, and to me that's wrong. And we can't find out, you know. And it's hard to get any information from DPP, and mm -hmm. so you know. So hopefully, you know, when you know when you get elected, you know, yeah. you can be our champion, you know, going into uh, to trying to you know resolve some of our problems that we're having with DPP because they affect everybody, yeah. uh, all, anybody in our community in the condo and the. HOA com community because we're always doing repairs. We're required, you know, the boards are required uh, under their declarations to repair and maintain the, the premises. Mm -hmm. That means you're, you've always got some building, some condo, or you know, some HOA applying for permits. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming, you know, it, it's it's becoming a nightmare. It is yeah. absolutely becoming a nightmare and it's becoming too expensive. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be looking for it too. So if you find that source that they're citing or relying on, I want to see it too. But yeah, as, as the council member, I'd be going in and having that conversation with DPP um, because ultimately, yeah, especially if we're wanting to incentivize meeting these reliable energy needs, right, or, or goals, we want to make sure that our associations, folks living in, um, you know, multi-unit dwellings have access to photovoltaic, to solar. And I think that some of the stuff we talked about regarding permitting is pretty straightforward, right? Yeah. In terms of speeding it up. And I think there has to be, you know, a willingness to kind of sit down and bring everyone together to have that conversation, folks in the industry, folks at the department, you know, folks in the community. Because like you said, the permitting issues affect everyone um, in, in all areas, right? Just walking door to door, um, you know, I got into a DPP conversation with a, um, you know, a resident and she brought up, oh yeah, our church was, you know, trying to get a permit and we lost our contractor, you know, so it affects like folks in their homes, folks in their condos, you know, folks just out in the community. And so I think solving it will definitely, you know, help, help 
relieve that burden everyone's feeling, but also help resolve our housing crisis, right? The, the shortage that we're experiencing, experiencing when we see these delays and the difficulty in getting new units up, right? Right. And well, you know what you mentioned about, you know, housing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I agree with you that, you know, uh, building condos and townhouse mm -hmm. projects, I mean, that helps, that helps, you know, with affordable housing, because those, those types of, uh, of structures you know, are, 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 are just, you know, perfect to address that need. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing that, you know, the city might, you might be interested as a council member is there used to be a time, you know, you, you know, condos have to pay for their own rubbish pickup. Mm -hmm. And, and because it's multifamily, you know, the, the high rises, we have P, the, the private haulers come and they come you know, every day, they have to come every day because, you know, you've got 300, yeah, 500, so 600 people living in a building, you know, you, you can't have your rubbish lying around, you get rats and bugs and whatever. But, you know, um, we we did have, uh, uh, there there used to be a time a couple of years ago where the, the Department of Environmental Services mm -hmm. would do a study for the townhouse projects. And we were able to persuade uh, the city to come and at least pick up twice because that okay. reduces the cost to the homeowners in that townhouse association, yeah. right? Because they're not paying. I mean, yes, they, they're going to pay for a five day pickup through their private hauler, but at mm -hmm. least they get two days of city pickup, which mm -hmm. reduces their cost. Yeah, no, that's and a that, good idea. Yeah, Why did that, so that stop? I'm sorry. So that policy stopped or went away? I think it, 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 yeah, it, I hasn't been, it, it, it hasn't been for a couple of years, but we had a okay. council and all, the only, and it was what, it was Arnold, it was years ago. Arnold Morgado used to be on the city council. Yeah. He got it for his townhouse project in, I think it was um, Wailuna, which is in Pearl City. Okay. Wailuna. But anyway, he got it and I found out about it. I said, hey, Arnold. You got yeah. it for your project, then you got to do it for everybody else in the, on the island. Exactly, and, right? So he agreed. He agreed, and so he talked to people. He got the uh, the Department of Environmental Services to go uh -huh. out to see. And see, that's when the trucks were bigger. They had to be able to do the turnaround and move in and out. Now the trucks are smaller. Okay. So there, you know, there's even more reason why they could probably do it. But you know, what we had to do it was a case by case basis, and we would. Uh, get the word out for to townhouse projects if they wanted to apply you know contact environmental services and this is a person you contact they'll send mm -hmm. somebody out to take a look to see if it's you know okay and they'll do two two days pickup because the city doesn't come every day we know yeah. that we know that mm -hmm. right but two days out of you know seven it it it's a cost savings oh yeah yeah right. so that's if that's something that you could support, you know, we'd, we'd appreciate seeing that, you know, implemented again. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes sense. That, I mean, that makes sense to me. And I think when you're looking at the the benefit that the community as a whole is receiving, right, talking about, because again, being that such a diverse district, um, you know, there's a lot of agricultural land, preservation land, that's an important part of the community. And I think, again, it comes down to incentivizing you know, associations and supporting them because that's where we're we're heading as a, uh, you know, as a community in terms of new, um, new housing, right? Of course, we're still going to have single family homes, right? But it's just a part of the big picture and the big process, right? And you know, maybe maybe there's a way to work that into building permits mm -hmm. because one of the reasons why uh, the city, you know, can't come into condo, uh, into a lot of condo projects is there's not enough room for the trucks to come in. Yeah. And if you if you look, you look at a condominium, and where the uh, the the rubbish uh, uh, areas are, yeah. it's very difficult for that those, those huge trucks to come in, and and so but that was that was something that was established by the building department mm. that said that you know there wasn't enough room for the for the turnarounds, therefore we're not going to pick up rubbish at condos. Yeah, interesting. No, that's right? so, that's definitely something to work on for sure. Right, because if, if you're going to be promoting this type of, you know, structure for affordable mm -hmm. housing, you know, and if you, we could get some, you know, even one or two days pickup, I mean, that's, that's, a, what do you call it? That's a savings. Mm -hmm. and, and every little bit helps because it seems like every time we turn around, we have something else. Like a, the city just last month passed something called benchmarking. Yeah. Right? And so, uh, and more and, about that. 
benchmarking for wow. electrical and water. And they're doing it by, by buildings. The first oh, wow. report has to be made in June of 2023. Yeah. And so this is also something new because we're there, you know, and, and, and when I testified, you know, and it was the department of, um, uh, what is it? Climate, uh, or CCSR climate change, sustainability. Right. Resiliency. They're the ones. And, and, and I said, you know, number one, can't you get that information from Kiko and water, water supply? And, and because if you, if you make us, us, meaning the condos provided, we don't have staff. We have a property manager, a managing agent, but they're going to charge us. Yeah. I mean, so every time you guys pass a law, I mean, and you mandate that we do something, we don't, you know, we have to pay somebody. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing in the bill that reimburses us, you know, for the cost. And I don't think it's going to cost a whole lot of money, but it's, it's you know, something that, you know, the government seems to want, like to do. And so that, that we, we have to deal with that next year. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, I think just having this conversation today, I mean, it's so clear to me that, you know, again, walking in the community, you see so many folks affected. And I've talked to so many people that are, you know, just ready to get up and sell their unit and move because costs are just going up too much. And so I think we got to do everything we can to keep costs down, to keep maintenance fees down, to, to keep that burden down so our local families aren't, you know, burdened more, right? Right. I'm, I'm so, I'm so glad to hear that. And, you know, um, and we, you know, you, you, and, and if you get elected, you probably will see me. I spent many, Perfect. many, many, many sessions down at the, the city council hearings, you know, when they were live and even by zoom, yeah. but, you know, um, and, and, and we've always had champions and I, and uh, Tyler Dos Santos, who's also running for uh, Carol Fukunaga seat has also assured us that he would, he would be our champion. And, you know, so, but we need champions because we got a lot of condos and HOAs on, on the island. And mm -hmm. you know, we need all the champions that we can get because like I said, you know, we seem to every, every time you turn around there, they're passing ordinances. And, and the very first hearing that they had on benchmarking, mm -hmm. I was the only one who showed up only because uh, Carol Fukunaga's office emailed me and said, did you know about this? Really? And I said, well, no, I didn't know about this. And so I submitted testimony saying, yeah. uh, because it, the first report was due June of this year. Okay. And so I appeared, I said, you know, none of us know about this. We only heard about it because, my, you know, council member Fukunaga's office emailed me and say, did you know about this? And of course we didn't know. Nobody told us. Yeah. And, 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 and you're asking us to, to, to do these reports and none of us have any money in our budget because our budgets report were done in 2021 for 2022. Mm -hmm. So there's no money in our budget to pay for benchmarking. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that they agreed with me. So they agreed to move it to 2023. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, because I testified, but I, you know, I said, you know, this is, you know, this is another example of, you know, you guys got to talk to us, yeah. you know, you know, it's lucky that, you know, we have a champion who will call me and said, are, do, are you aware of this? And is it going to affect you? You know, that's what we need. We need people you know, to tell us things like that so that we can get people down to the city council and say, hell, no, this doesn't, you know, we don't need this and mm -hmm. we don't like this and we don't want this. And, and you know, so that we can be part of the discussion. And yeah. if it wasn't for somebody telling us, did you know about this? We would have not have known and it would just sail through because nobody would have shown up. Yeah, I think you're right. You're spot on. I think that it's important that the community be given that opportunity to come in, right, and be a part of the conversation and help direct, you know, where legislation and policy is going. I mean, that's why elected officials are there. You know, they're there to work and serve the people, not the other way around. And so, you know, I think that's a big part of the process, right, is is making sure as the, you know, the person with access to the information, you're taking it to the community. And you know, getting that feedback. And I'm so glad to hear you say that because when, once you get elected, you will you you're gonna have to have people on your staff to answer the phones because that's what I do. I tell people, yeah. call your elected official. And if it was uh, a city council issue, call your council member and this is your council member, or go to the website and they have people who will answer the phones, and their only job 
is constituent concerns and you're a constituent. And so you pick up the phone and you call them and say, my name is so-and-so, I'm a constituent and I yeah. vote and they will help you. They will bend over backwards. I said, and you know, and I've had people call me back and say, you know, I made that call and they did, they helped me, they responded. I said, yeah, that's what they're there for. That's why yeah. you gotta learn to call them. And that's the best I can tell you as a candidate, right? I've never been in office, mm -hmm. but that's by far the best part of this process is showing up at a door and just having a conversation with someone and letting them express and share what they want to see government do better. And, you know, you get, you're able to tap into that generational knowledge in our community, right? And, and hear, you know, about the history of our community and also just learn where the community wants us to be going you know, together. And so, yeah, having those conversations, I think, is what I look forward to most um, if I'm lucky enough to get elected. Okay, well, we're, we've run out of time. I'm so glad you were able to spend your afternoon uh, with us and, um, and good luck in your campaign. And if you get elected, we look forward to working with you and hope you can be one of our champions on our issues. I look forward to it. And again, thanks for having me. And I look forward to continuing to, you know, connect and talk story. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Okay. Aloha. And, and thank you to, to our listeners uh, who uh, are on the show. And uh, please uh, tune in next week for a very uh, interesting show. It will be uh, Raylene Tenno. And so uh, mahalo and aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.